some of you I know already know Rabbi Tilchin. For others, you are here to discover her wisdom and wit for the first time. So I am going to introduce her. Uh, she is the founder and spiritual leader of the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County, which is a nonprofit organization <laughs> created. This way. It's gone. <laughs> Sound cue. Uh, created to help Orange County Jewish residents and their families reconnect with Judaism and attach their personal passions to a Jewish network. Uh, her commitment to helping people find what is meaningful to them is a signature of her leadership. She received her cantorial degree from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City and her rabbinic ordina ordination from the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Can you hear me? Barely. More or less? Barely. Okay. Barely. She's going to be doing more of the talking and she's a cantor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be able to hear Rabbi Tilchin. Uh, and I, I really recommend um, the Jewish Collaborative. I love davening with Marsha and she's just a wonderful, all around fabulous uh, person, leader, friend, singer, uh, rabbi, etc. Now, before returning to Jewish life in the early 1990s, Marsha's passion was actually theater. Uh, she majored in theater at Wesleyan University, and she worked as an actor and comedian in Washington, D.C. from 1985 to 1988. And she toured as the hearing actress with the National Theater for the Deaf from 1988 to 1990. So Eli contacted me in May, or actually it was earlier than that, it was probably more like January, and he was already committed to producing The Merchant of Venice, uh, but he knows that this is a controversial play, it, it deals with sensitive material, um, some patrons can get angry at this play, uh, and he was interested in kind of getting deeper into the Jewish background of the play. And so he asked me who I knew that would be a good consultant for specifically the ritual and Jewish historical dimensions of the play. And I immediately thought of Marcia, knowing her love of theater, her musical talents as a cantor, and her interest in engaging with UCI and the larger community. And so Marcia came to uh, our early rehearsals and she worked with uh, our Shylock and our Jessica on an opening prologue scene featuring the Jewish Sabbath. And she has attended uh, tech rehearsals. And she also worked with me just this last Wednesday for our Educators Day, in which we brought 30 teachers from uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, and Orange County for a day of learning about the play, followed by seeing the performance here at the New Swan. So, Marcia has really become an amazing partner for us in thinking about what it means to stage this play today. And so I'm going to be asking her some questions, and then we will open it up for Q&A to the rest of you so that you can also ask her your questions about Jews and Judaism in The Merchant of Venice. So, okay. so my first question is, it was really great having you in the rehearsal room during those early sessions with our actors. And I'd like you to tell our guests a little bit about what you saw in rehearsal and also what you felt you were able to bring to our production. And I'm thinking specifically of the work that you did with Greg Shylock and Crystal Jessica, but really anything else that, was, um, that you felt kind of clicked for you and for the group in our meetings together. Thank you. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. I, I'm humbled, I will say. And um, I just want to say, like, I've missed the theater for so many years that this just really gave me a new zest for who I used to be. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, when I was invited to be a consultant, I wasn't exactly sure what that meant because the play as a play is a is a complete entity and so i was invited to do two things one i came to the first reading and i had a chance to listen to the script and the actors 
already who could sort of infuse some life into the characters, even though it was a it was a round table, essentially. And then I came to another rehearsal where I saw the opening dance, which you'll see. And then it was explained to me in that moment because this was in the director's mind. This is what I want to capture while the dance is happening. And when he shared with me that this is a Sabbath Eve, I immediately understood that the traditions, even that we practice today in a traditional Jewish household, really mirror what has been done for certainly since, I would say, the 11 or 1200s. Since Ashkenazi Judaism, I can't really speak for what was happening in the far, far east, you know, how they lit their candles, what they would have done, but I do know that our law codes that were codified in the, in the 16th century would reflect practices that we still have conversations about today. So I said, well, clearly, if there is a, a young lady who has no mother, she's the woman of the household. So she would be lighting her candles and she would be doing so in the same way that my mother did and my grandmother and five generations before. And I said, and if he's her father, he will be blessing her as all heads of male, Jewish male heads of household did um, ever since really the destruction of the temple and the whole idea that your, that your table became the substitute for the altar when we were a cultic people and, and, and insofar as an understanding that when you sat down to a holiday meal, there was a quality of priesthood for every man to be able to bless his family as the priest had once did, you know, like, like <laughs> Spock had done and whatever, right? You know what I'm saying? So, but I did not with that way, but so, so the idea is that he would have blessed her. So I explained to them that whole sort of dynamic. I recited the brachot, the blessings for them. Um, each in their iPhones. I explained to them what it, what it meant and what they, they videoed me, what I would have done, like, this is what you would do. And, and um, you'll see. I mean, it's really quite touching. And, and the other thing that was, you know, there was so, so many layers, because once I started thinking about what it would be for this young lady to grow up without a mother, and we started to talk about the whole family dynamic. You know, the, nobody had one child back then. You had multiple children. But of course, Shylock couldn't have multiple children because he lost his wife when his daughter was so young. So it was, a, it was a very unconventional Jewish family. And I said, who were her female role models? Did she have aunts? Did you have sisters? Did, you know, who, who came and sort of taught her how to make the kugel? so to speak, if it wasn't a kugel probably in Italy, but something like that. So these were the conversations that we had. Um, and uh, it just, I think it opened up so much for all of us in, and, and hopefully for them, this I won't know, in terms of their internal understanding of their characters as the, as the rehearsals unfolded. Beautiful. That was our sound cue. <laughs> Well, I thought it would, these were great sessions that we had, and uh, it was really great having you uh, present. So a question that comes up uh, every time we share this play is, is The Merchant of Venice anti-Semitic? In what way is it? In what way is it not? So you spent some time with the play in the past, and you spent a lot of time with the play this summer. What, what are your kind of standing on one foot, as Rabbi Hillel says, what are your thoughts about Shakespeare and anti-Semitism? Well, I will say that in, in the early years when I was exposed to this play, I, I wasn't looking at it through a Jewish lens at all. I was, because I, I wasn't particularly engaged at that point in my life. I, and. Um, uh, but as I became a student of Jewish history, which I had to through my learning at seminary, um, I, uh, I began to integrate, I would ask myself those questions as well. And um, so I, I, I'll give you, my, la I'll give you my, my bottom line and then I'll tell you why I'm there. In truth, I don't think this could have been an anti-Semitic effort because how the, um, the relationship of the Jewish population of England to Shakespeare's time would be that the likelihood that he interacted in any significant way with a Jewish population was, was nil. But, but so 
I'll just, I'll say it like that. And in fact, I was reading in, in preparation for the work that I did with the teachers the other day, I was reading a number of different essays about who this play was for. And what, what was pointed out to me is that at this point, this is right when the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church in England are really like this. And so when Shakespeare was writing this, it probably never occurred to him that a Jew would see this. But because the Jew is always the lightning rod for a message, that we've been for thousands of years. And, and why that is, is a separate lecture. But because it's the lightning rod, he, it was written so that the Protestants sort of saw Shylock as the Catholics, and the Catholics saw Shylock as the Protestants. And that, and when, when I read that, I was like, of course, that's so interesting. And that, but you actually taught me something that really opened my mind. So you'll hear some really powerful and sensitive speeches come out of Shylock's mouth that, that only a person who was seeing the humanity in the character could have written. I mean, we, we think about it now, you know, the, the, the Jewish people sort of can't win for losing. You know, we, we talked a little bit about this. The far left has issues with Israel and the far right with, you know, age old historical European anti-Semitism, white supremacy. And we're sort of standing here in the middle trying to actually just live our lives in America or wherever we are and and try to try to make the world a better place because that's that was our job, right? To be a light unto the nations. OK, so having said that, um, Shylock has the, it's the greatest expression of that when he says, okay, you're coming to me for money. You hate me. You spit on me. You kick me. You insult me. But when you need 3,000 ducats, you come to my house. Like, what is that? If, could, could, a, could a dog give you money? I mean, it's such, a, such an interesting thing. And of course not. They know that he's a person. And just, just capturing that. And then, of course, the later monologue, you know, about, you know, you know, do I do I have feelings? Does a does a Jew bleed? Do I not bleed, et cetera, et cetera? So, a no one who was anti-Semitic would have written that. But even more interesting, when you pointed out in the lecture that the likelihood that Shakespeare probably encountered some Jewish people in in his life is is high. Jewish people were doing commerce. Not they weren't living and doing business in England, but they were doing business. And probably one or two came over on a boat with a thing or he was traveling and they were also artists. And he probably ran into a performer or two or a troupe or two. And and my guess is it was probably one of those things where if he had even a distant encounter, he was probably thinking all the rhetoric that was sort of in the soil of England, in the water of England about the villainous Jew that was that was part of what he knew. That was part of the 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 womb that he grew up in. But he probably met a couple of people and said, that guy doesn't seem so bad. You know what I'm saying? Like he probably and he was like, I wonder why, which might have really gave him the impetus to give this man a life because he was like in the same way. Now, if we only heard horrible things about a some body of people we never knew and then we met them and learned that they had some of the same problems we did, you know, you go like, wait a minute, I was fed the wrong information. So that's my new theory. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Uh, so on Wednesday, as I mentioned, we brought 30 teachers here to UCI for Educators Day. And you, had, you led a session with our teachers uh, called Learning About Jews and Judaism Through the Merchant of Venice in a Pluralist Interfaith Framework. And you, you t took us through some really interesting readings. We read a scene out loud, Act 1, Scene 3. And then you uh, shared some, some Torah and some modern Midrash and some other texts with us. Uh, what, what's your feeling about the teachability of The Merchant of Venice in 2019 in our public high schools today in California? <clears throat> so two things. I think that the source material that I brought in um, probably wouldn't be so relevant, taught by perhaps a non-Jewish teacher to a non-Jewish audience. But I think the most relevant thing would be that scene and really, really looking at the humanity of Shylock and sharing with the students, really in a historical fashion, that Shakespeare could not have written this because his best friend was Jewish, right? That, that it, it, you know, we, we do know that, that many things have happened throughout history that 
you know, certainly the state of Israel, people who were early supporters because they understood from an inside perspective why that would be so important or what was happening. That that was not a benefit that he had. So how could so um, what can we learn about our own biases? I think I think there's a there's so much to learn about natural and societal bias that we have even when we think we don't. And as I shared, I, I think an amazing exercise with any audience of a certain you know, cognitive level to say, what script would you write about a group of people that you only know stereotypes about? And that would be a fascinating way to do some research, you know, go meet one, you know, whatever it is, and see where that takes you. So, yeah. Beautiful. And one of the things that you did with the teachers was Marcia took us through Act 1, Scene 3, when Shylock first encounters Bassanio and Antonio in the Rialto. And she asked us to pull out from the text, what would you learn about Jews and Judaism from this text? And it was quite striking how much was in there. Okay. There were dietary laws. Right. Um, I'm sorry, okay, that's so, what you were saying. Well, that's just another part of it. So maybe just share a, a second of that and then. So, <clears throat> you know, how we eat is, has always been really until, I'll, t I'll step back, I'll tell you a story that I have, I have a friend who was he, a teacher of mine who became religious later in life. And he became so religious that he was following his rabbi's um, rule that um, he was at Yale and that he could not go to a wine and cheese party for his department. And he wanted to go and the rabbi said, you can't go, why can't you go? Because you may socialize with somebody and you might, a, a, a lady, he was single, you might socialize with a lady and then who knows what would happen after you socialize with that lady, I'm not kidding, right? So, I, I, I mean, I was like, you went to Yale in the like 70s and he was like, yeah. So my, my point being when the, dining with the other is a fair is a relatively new practice that is post enlightenment. You know, people eating is a very personal experience, and because again we have so many dietary restrictions, even men that did business together way back in the day weren't weren't the Jews were not eating at the pub. They couldn't, right? So when 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 um, when Bassanio says you'll come dine with us, I mean Bassanio is kind of a little you can see like sort of a little less tainted with hatred for, then you feel that Antonio is, at least that's the yeah. expression I get. So he says, come down with it. And, and, and Shylock's like, what are you nuts? I mean, I will do business with you. I will, I will have discussions with you, but I will not dine with you, whatever. And so I brought in the passage from Genesis when Joseph, if you know the story of Joseph and his brothers, when he's now deeply ensconced in Egypt, he looks like an Egyptian, probably smells like an Egyptian, all of that, but he's not an Egyptian never was an Egyptian. Pharaoh knew he was an Egyptian. Pharaoh knew that he was the Israelite that came out of the dungeon to interpret his dreams. And so when the brothers come and he sees Benjamin and that, that whole reunion happens, um, he, I, I, before he reveals himself, it says everybody went to dine. They all split up. The Egyptians went to dine. The, brother, the Hebrews went to dine. And Joseph went to dine because it was an abomination for the Egyptians to eat with the Hebrews. And it was just such a fascinating thing that that already the practice of really separating how you eat, even though he was the vizier of Egypt, I mean, he was, right? So I think that that custom really lasted for, sent for, for millennia, actually. And um, the, uh, what, the twist came here, though. The twist came that as rabbinic law became more and more dense and the rules about Jewish dietary practice, which really evolved into the Middle Ages, more and more rigidity and really what they call is building a fence around the fence, meaning lest you should eat something that you shouldn't eat, we're going to say you can't eat this thing, even though you could have eaten that thing, but because that thing kind of looks like this thing, you can't eat that thing, and then you can't eat that thing or that thing and that thing, right? So, so the rules became, so then it became the other way around, It be as opposed to it being an abomination for the Egyptians to eat with the Israelites, it became an abomination for the Jews to eat with the other. So we talked about that. And then, and then the other thing that we, I will just say is um, a piece of the script is at one point um, Sh uh, Shylock espouses on the story the, the tension between Jacob and his father-in-law, Laban. And he actually recounts this whole tale. And I brought in a modern 
text about how a, a Jewish social justice group has sort of spun the Jacob Laban story to talk about workers' rights. So I said, you know, there's just so many ways you can look at the Torah, and I thought that was funny. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, should we do Q&A now? So I want to, first of all, thank Rabbi Tilshin for that was fantastic. I know you have your own questions for the rabbi, so we, or for our director, Eli Simon. So let's open it up to the floor. Yes. Hi. Um, what you said about who gets to teach Jessica to be a Jewish woman was really insightful. But I still think for audience who haven't given that idea thought, the fact that she would, without any consideration of her Jewishness, steal off into the night with a non-Jewish boy is pretty shocking. Um, how, how, do, how does that mesh with her Jewishness that she is able to overcome her her sense of a partness as part of the Jewish population to commit to this other um, part of society? A profound question, and I think one of the things that really reveal the truth that that would not have really ever been possible, which is how you know that Shakespeare didn't really understand Jewish culture and the Jewish family. You know what I'm saying? Like he was sort of an imagining, you know, the, maybe the wealthy Jewish population in Venice, which is something, it was almost as if he was foreseeing two years ahead of his time, you know, whether it was Huddle who leaves her father Tevye because she meets the guy in the field, but that probably was not happening in the fifth, you know, in that time. So I think it reveals actually an ignorance. I'm not excusing it, I'm just saying. I think that's a very interesting question. And building off that, I would like to say, um, the daughter in Othello also marries out. Mm -hmm. And to a reaction by her father. So is that something that motherless daughters are seen to do? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. That is really because daughters in fiction that we know from Nancy Drew onward are motherless if they're heroine. Is that something you have taught about before, motherless daughters in Shakespeare? Well, almost all of Shakespeare's daughters are motherless, partly because there weren't enough men in his troupe who were, <laughs> who were able to play women. So we do have all these motherless daughters. Wow. Uh, but he was also very interested, in, and that's a kind of exigency of the, of the all-male theater, the period. Uh, but he was interested in what he inherited from Roman comedy was the idea of a daughter having a love interest that disagreed with her father's choice for her. I see. And, but he then takes that, in Roman comedy, that does not usually have any distinctive features to it. And he really pushes it in plays like Othello and The Merchant of Venice to really make that conflict into something more sociological, more racial, more ethnic, um, more embattled, and, and, and having more values at stake in the choice that the daughter and her new partner make. Um, so Shakespeare is, as always, working with folkloric and Roman material, but thinking about it in these very prescient modern ways. Um, so it feels like a fairy tale, but it also feels like the newspaper. Absolutely, and, and what, what is really remarkable about the dynamic between Jessica and her father and taking his wealth and like getting out of the hell or whatever it was is actually very modern. We know stories of that in the last 100, 150 years it's just, so it was almost as if it was a foreshadowing. I was saying, you know, there are three, at one point there are three different kinds of sort of Jewish um, characters in the play. There is, first of all, th there's Shylock, who is, who is the bridge between the, the non-Jewish, the, the other, the Gentile business world, and, and yet bringing his Jewish expertise and sensibility of his expertise in money lending to that. So he's a bridge. He works in both. Then there's 
Tubal, who is his kinsman, who we don't really know is act, interacting in a, in a very hostile way. He's really, it seems like he's more with the Hebrews, sort of in his clan. And then there's the daughter who can't wait to get out. So there's, you know, th- those are really three different kinds of Jewish persona that we actually recognize in our time. I thought that was, I don't know, I, I might have made that up, but that I struck it. me. I love it. Okay, I think we're going to be uh, opening the theater. Eli, any, any closing comments on why you decided to direct this play? <laughs> so beautifully. <laughs> well, you have an incredible treat ahead of you. It's a brilliant production. Eli has done some very innovative things with Shakespeare's text. It's his fourth time directing it, so he knows it extremely well. And you are in in wonderful hands for tonight's performance. And we just want to thank Julian Marsha. Thank you so much. Uh,